Good morning and welcome. Thank you for respecting our social distancing guidelines recommended by the Presbytery. Please maintain an appropriate distance from those you don't live with and place your mask over your mouth to participate in congregational singing and responsive readings. Give thanks for all of God's great gifts. Praise God for the gift of the Spirit. Come and be transformed by wind and fire, by dreams and visions. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. Wrapped in light as with a garment, you stretch out the you set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping with things innumerable are there, living things both small and great. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Let us pray. God, our Creator, Earth has many languages, but your gospel proclaims your love to all nations in one heavenly tongue. Make us messengers of the good news that, through the power of your spirit, all the world may unite in one song of praise through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and and forever. Amen. Please rise and join in the singing of Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart.
Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come then, let us confess our sins to the one who is faithful to forgive. Let us adore the one who is mighty to save. Please join in the printed prayer of confession. Almighty God, you poured your spirit upon the gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and a community of faith. We confess that we hold back the force of your spirit among us. We do not listen for your word of grace and speak the good news of your love or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your spirit and fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people, doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Don't be afraid. God's Holy Spirit brings you healing, comfort, and hope. You are being prepared to serve God in some mighty ways. Rejoice. God's Holy Spirit is with you always. Amen. The glory of God reigns in a, each of us. The peace of Christ be with you.
Let us bow for a prayer for illumination. O oh God, open our hearts, minds, and souls to hear your word as if for the first time. Help us experience anew the surprise and joy that your presence in the word can bring us. Amen. Scripture reading today uh, comes from Acts 2, verses 1 to 21, and the second reading will be from 1 Corinthians 12, 3 to 13. Reading from Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from the heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they ask, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belong to Serene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And from Corinthians. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and the other the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another 
the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. This is a very special day. It is also a very meaningful day as we think of what's going on nationwide from Minneapolis to Los Angeles. This is, this is a day of the Pentecost or the birth of the church as a community of all people coming together. It is very meaningful, the message that we receive by the power of the Holy Spirit today. And I do hope by the time we finish our worship that we truly go out and let the service begin by ourselves being the preacher and being the people who go out and do this message of the Pentecost, which is a message of love, reconciliation, and bridging to build the community, not to destroy the community. We have been talking about the essential tenets of the Holy Catholic Church. And I, I can't say more about how meaningful this phrase in the Apostle Creed to all of us and to this nation today, more than any time else, that phrase that says, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church. And it's amazing how the uh, great parents of the church, when they put that Apostle Creed together, and it was done on like starting from the year 325 on, it started even earlier. You know, if you read Paul and Peter, uh, th their message and their epistles, they talk a lot about pieces of this Apostle Creed. But the whole thing finished almost by the year 451. It took that long to put this wonderful Apostle Creed that we repeat every morning. And this particular phrase, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church. Well, today is that combination of both of them. Today we're talking about the Holy Ghost, but we also continue talking about all of us as the Holy Catholic Church God intended to be. Last Sunday, it was Jesus' promise to the disciples and to the rest of the, of the people at that time when they asked him, is it the hour yet? Are you going to, uh, uh, are you going to restore the kingdom of heaven? Remember what Jesus said. No, you're, 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 you're getting it wrong. I'm not talking about an earthly political kingdom. I'm talking about kingdom that is in heaven. As it is in heaven, Christ wanted to be on earth. A kingdom of peace. A kingdom of love. And he told them, this is not easy. That's why he said, but the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost will come upon you and you become my witnesses in Judea, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and into the end of the world and into the end of the earth. Today is the day. Today is the day to which that power came upon the disciples. And sure enough, immediately, they became powerful witnesses to the community and to the end of the earth. In Acts chapter 1, we heard the very first Christian sermon ever, and it was so powerful. It was so powerful that 3,000 people 
committed their life to Christ at that day. By who? By somebody called Peter, who was very timid before the coming upon him, before the, uh, the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Peter denied Christ three times, right? And the way to, uh, to be crucified. And Jesus re reminded him of that by looking at him when he denied him. But the same Peter would stand courageously after the receiving of the power and preaching the good news to people who crucified Christ. It is a very special day and today as we preach this message of reconciliation of, of the gathering of the gathering of people who are different from each other. In such a challenging world with racial rights almost everywhere in our nation today, the message of the Pentecost cannot be more meaningful. Let me take you a little back to the background of the Pentecost. There were three major festivities that the Jewish people will celebrate every year. Each of these three must be attended if you are a Jew lives within 20 miles far from Jerusalem. You must attend. These three are the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Feast of the Tabernacles. The word Pentecost means the 50s. Just a very simply mean the 50s. Simply because it fell on the 50s day after the Passover. So if the Passover was in mid-April, and you may remember we actually celebrated Easter, which is a replacement of the Passover. Because we don't do Passover anymore. We don't present sacrifices and kill animals anymore. Jesus offered himself a full sacrifice, not just for the sin of, of the Jewish people, but the sins of the whole world. Therefore, Easter replaced Passover. And we, and both of them, fell in the same day. Just like Jews in Israel or other places in the world who have not accepted Christ yet or do not believe in Christianity, they still celebrate Passover and we celebrate Easter. Both of them almost within the same week. So if we celebrate Easter or the Jewish nation celebrated Passover in the mid of April, well, the bent cost, you add 50 days to that, it will be in the beginning of June. We celebrated Easter on apparently in the 7th, right? The 7th of, of April. So from April 7 to May 31st, that's a 50 days. That is what is, it means Pentecost or the day of the 50s. Which explains the big list of countries mentioned in Acts 1. Why? Because it was some, almost summertime, a, sp a spring, a wonderful time to travel, wonderful time to go and be in Jerusalem. That's why when we read Acts chapter 1, you see all of those people from all over the world coming together. And that must be intentional as God is planning to birth, to give birth to the church. You have heard me saying before, that even until that moment, the Christians were not called Christians. They were still thinking of themselves as a Jewish, a new Jewish denomination. And they were worshiping in the Jewish temple. But after the coming of this power and coming of the Holy Spirit, they, as Jesus said, you then become witnesses to me. You're no longer going to be Moses' witness. You're no longer going to be witness, wit, witnesses of the Jewish state. You are going to be witnesses of the kingdom of God, a kingdom of love and peace. 
It was very obvious that God has something in the making. It is very obvious that God wanted us to see the church as a global, international, and intercultural community of faith. By gathering all those people from all over the world, as we read. The same idea we have been talking for a whole month now about the Catholic Church as the universal church, a church that is broad and wide, a church that is inclusive of all people from every nation, from every tribe, and from every language. You know, when they start to speak in tongue, what happened? People start to murmur, they start to talk. What are we hearing here? What are those Galileans are doing, are saying? Speaking in tongue, they were accused of being drunk. And you remember when Peter stood up with his first sermon, he started by explaining what's happening. And he started to go back to the scripture, to quote the scripture, and to remind all those people, all those powerful, powerful, sophisticated. It was like a, it was like a very sophisticated a high stable church gathering, okay, with people from all these countries who were able to travel and able to spend money as tourists and to get together. Since this is the first birthday of the church, I invite you to think of the word first. Do you like the word first? I do. First means something you would not forget because you've done it for the first time. Who forget his first day in school? Or having the first child? Who forgets having their first cast? Or first car, or first time traveling abroad? So let's talk about this first thing, because what, what Peter did, he took them to first things. He took them to their memory and tried to refresh their memory a little bit, uh, by quoting the scripture and particularly quoting Joel and particularly chapter 2 of Joel. So let's talk about this to relate to you what I just said about the birth of the church was intentionally to be intercultural, multilingual, multiracial, multicultural, and in and, and global ecumenical community. In the very, very first chapter of Genesis, now I'm talking about that word first, so that after you leave here, you are truly going to memorize the sermon, okay? I'm going to test you. Because it's very easy. First, the creation was the very first thing mentioned in the scripture, right? The very first chapter of Genesis, the very first chapter, when you read it, there is a phrase, and that phrase was repeated in the very first chapter, in the very first page, actually, of the scripture. That phrase was repeated nine times. Nine times. Every time God creates something, says God created them of every kind. And another, of every kind, God created this. And God created this. Of every kind. Amazing. The beginning of the world, the beginning of that creation was intentionally to be a community of diversity. The animals, the birds, the monsters, everything was created of every kind. Let me take you a little deeper. Before that creation of that wonderful diversity, of animals and birds and even human. Before that creation, when it was only one thing, when the earth was one thing, just one thing, the Bible tells us that it was formless void. Formless void means ugly, has no shape, has no beauty. It was formless void. But when God started to create that diverse, diversity, God looked, and I'm quoting the scripture, God looked and what God has made was good. 
Right? Do you remember that? That also was repeated seven times. Every day, God creates something new. God looked, and what God has created was good. Until the completion of that creation by creating the male and the female of the human being, God looked, and what God has made was good? No, was very good. Was very good. Very good. That was the first thing. Let's go a little bit, and I'm not going to take you the whole scripture, but just a few of them. Let's look at the very first mission. Who was sent first? Who was called to get out of his kindred and his loved one and to journey into the unknown, the unfamiliar, the unsettling, and to go somewhere else? It was that very first family of faith, Abraham and his wife Sarah. They were called to get out. Here is, here is exactly the scripture reading of it. Get out of your kindred and your loved ones. I am sending you somewhere else. I'm sending you to other nations. And, and the promise was this. You will be a great nation. I will bless you and make you a blessing. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And in you, Abraham, not your own race, not your own culture, not your own nation, but all the families of the earth will be blessed. Isn't that amazing? The very first call, the very first call to mission is a mission or a call to bless the nations, if we summarize that. A call to bless the nations, not the nation but the nations in the plural. Majority of the Old Testament prophecies were advocates of an all-people congregation, an all-inclusive, wide, broad, and diverse community of faith. When people accused the disciples of being drunk, as we said, Peter stood and quoted Joel, in the last days, Joel says, it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And notice the word all. And he is not going to stop. I mean, that could have been clear enough. You know, God is going to pour his Holy Spirit upon all flesh, flesh, all people. But it wasn't good enough. Joel continued to say in details, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters. Do you see the language of diversity? Not just male, but male and female. All of them are equal. To your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Then everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the message of the scripture. This is a new thing that God is, was at making to create a community, to remind people of the creation. Guys, this, is, this was my intention from the beginning when I created the world. I created intentionally of every kind. And later on, when, I, when the church started, it started as such a global gathering of people from all corners of the earth at the time. There is at least two other quotations, very important quotations. If I were Peter preaching that sermon, I would not just quote Joel. I'll quote Isaiah. Isaiah, in chapter 56, Isaiah says something very revolutionary. He says, thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from God's people. 
And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. What? Better than sons and daughters? The eunuchs will give that? Oh, not just only the eunuch. I will give, I will also bless the foreigner and to the foreigners. I will bring to my holy mountain and, ma and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offering and their sacrifice will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. That is a conclusion. For my house will be called the house of prayer for all people. Now remember, that's before the Pentecost. That is in the Old Testament. That is a prophecy about God's intentionality of creating that diverse world and how God is going to work it out somehow to also create the church, to start the church. That says God, who gathered the outcasts of Israel, the Israelites, the Jewish nation or the Jewish people are not going to be forgotten. They are also part of that gathering. So it says, Thus says the Lord God, who gathered the outcast of Israel, I will gather others to them beside those already gathered. Are you there with me? You see the dynamics of the gathering? You see how, how it is clear in the scripture our calling as a community of faith, let the politic aside, let the politic politicians say whatever they wanted to say, but as faithful Christians who believe in the Old and the New Testament and the Apostle Creed, this is, this is what we are challenged to do this morning. This is what we are called to believe in. One more quote from Isaiah 66 this time, 66, 18. It sums up the above in one verse. It says, For I know their works. And Isaiah 66 was actually also talking about other nations. We're talking about the Gentiles. We're talking about this nation that the Israelites were looking at them from up to down. And this is the, the prophecy actually that intended to be also a prophecy about the Pentecost. For I know their works and their thoughts and I'm coming I'm coming to gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and shall see my glory and I will set a sign among them and they shall declare my glory among the nations. Again, the beginning of the church was intentionally from the prophecy and from what happened intentionally meant to be global, to be international, to be intercultural to be a community of people from all over the corners of the earth. Isn't this is what happening in the day of Pentecost? When the day of Pentecost had come, we read they were all together in one place. They were all together. They were not segregated or separated, but they were all together in one place. The church was born in a global form. The people who were there from every nation under heaven. There were African from Egypt. Thank God my ancestors were there. If America were discovered by then, they were there. Well, European were there and many of you came from Europe, right? There were people from Rome. They were people from Turkey. There were people from Sudan, Libya. They were Asian, from Asia and Asia Minor, right? There were even Arabs and Jews who are not talking to each other. And yet they were there at the day of Pentecost. There were rich and poor, high educated and not educated at all. There were male and female, a slave and free, a global intercultural and international community of faith. That's how the church started. Now let's look at another first thing. Uh, because this is important. Later on in the history of the church, there was a conflict, and I already covered that at one of my sermons about that conflict between Peter and Paul. 
Paul believes that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. He is to go to those people who are marginalized. He is to go to those people who are hated by the Jewish people. He, he gave them his, his life, his intentionality. And he declared that God has given him this vision. God has given this message to go and to be friend to the friendless and to the people who are hated by others. But Peter said, I have nothing to do with those people. He said, they're unclean. They're, it's unlawful to mix with them. This is, this is exactly the wording. And I will read it uh, when we come to it. But, but Paul, no. The Gentiles are partakers in the kingdom of God. So the church was about to be divided. In fact, that could have destroyed the church because it, it was in its beginning. It, it can't afford to be divided. So what happened? God has given a vision to Peter to fix his mentality, to let him go of his prejudiced views about the Gentiles. That vision was a table that full of, of things to eat. And apparently he was hungry before sleeping. So he had, that, he had that great dream of everything is being in front of him. And in front of him there were things that the law says, yeah, it's okay for you to eat. But there are things that he's supposed not to eat as he believed all of his life. So God says, go, woke up Peter, kill and eat. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he kept telling him, and you know, and finally God said, what I allow, you do not prohibit. I am now telling you to get up and, and to kill and eat. And when he walked up, he went to that first assembly. We call it the first ecumenical council. The word ecumenical, just like the word Catholic, it means the whole inhabited earth. It's a Greek word. It says that the whole church was gathered together to solve this issue and to discuss it. So people from all over the leadership of, of, the, of the churches at that time gathered together to solve this problem. But thank God, before Peter went, and there was another reason, by the way, if you go read Acts chapter 10. The other reason is that there was a man called Cornelius. Cornelius was one of the very first Gentiles to believe in the gospel. And he needed to be baptized. And, and the people, his people, went to Peter to ask Peter to come and to baptize this Gentile man. You see how funny it is? Well, he wouldn't go, we know that. That's why he got that vision. Before Cornelius' men came to ask him to go with them to baptize Cornelius the Gentile man. So after all of this events, Peter, when he went to the church, to the council, to Jerusalem, where the leadership are gathering, he said his famous saying that now I know, when I woke up, I knew that God has no partiality. Amazing. So the church had to decide this issue and it was decided according to Peter's withdrawal of his position. He said, guys, I am transformed. I am no longer Peter that you know. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. This is exactly what was said in Isaiah 56, it's exactly the same about the foreigners, the eunuchs, people who believe, people who accept the gospel, they are my brother and my sisters. They are, there is no longer going to be a partiality. So we've already seen the beginning of the creation, the beginning of the church, the very first mission, right? And the first issue and the first ecumenical council. These things you can't forget. But finally, there is one more first, one more beginning. That is the beginning hereafter. 
That's the beginning of the church when the church ended in, on earth and started in heaven. We call it the victorious church. How it looks like that church? How the church in heaven looks like? Are you excited? Are you excited? Well, look. This is what John in Revelation saw. John, and you know the book of Revelation is all about the end of time, the beginning of the church hereafter. So in Revelation chapter 7, he described what he saw. He said, I looked and there were a great multitude of people that no one could count. Now we could understood it and we, like the word all flesh, all people, we could understand, okay. There are people of, of all kind are there in heaven. But no, he wanted to go farther and explain everything. I looked and there were a great multitude of people that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And notice the word nation and tribe. Small people, small communities, but also big ones. You all count it as well. You may live in a small place, but you are counted. You are God's people. Let's now turn into the, what happened in the Pentecost. And this is my last point. I need a lot of concentration because it's truly, I believe, that it is a good news for me and for you today. Let's talk a little bit about the power that the disciple received. And I know you, there are so many um, explanation, but I wanted to give you what is meaningful to today, what is meaningful to America today, what is meaningful to our relationship to Pisca and to New Rehobas today, what it means, the power that the disciple received power to us as a community of lover of Christ and as a community of faithful people. What happened at the Pentecost? is that for the very first time in their lives, this mixed crowd were hearing the word of God in a way that struck a straight home to their hearts. And they could understand the message that was amazingly proclaimed by a bunch of Galilean fishermen who many of them had no education or knowledge of any foreign language. That was powerful. And that was given, not to everyone, but was given to the lowest class of people at the time. Here we see the Pentecost, which marked the beginning of the church, provide the ideal solution to issue of race and culture of our day. The Pentecost story, or the stories after which we already talked about, like Peter's transformation and the baptizing of the Gentile Cornelius by Peter and the Ethiopian eunuch by Philip, provide the ideal image of how people of different racial and cultural background should be able to live together. At the Pentecost, there was some power dynamics that we need to stop at with some depth. It was clear from what Jesus said that the coming of the Holy Ghost upon disciples is a power given and a power received. When Paul wanted to encourage his disciples, Timothy, he asked him not to be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because God, and I'm quoting, God did not give us a spirit of fear but rather a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Well, that spirit of power was given to the least in society, to the fishermen who were the lowest social class and were the minority of that day. The audience, those people who came from all these places, the audience, those who were listening to them, were the powerful in society. They were the majority, and they were the sophisticated and rich. They, politically and socially powerful, and yet they were amazed to, les to listen to those fishermen. One of my Episcopalian priests, his name is Eric Law. And by the way, I have a couple, a couple of, 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 the, of the book that I'm going to refer to uh, if you ever wanted to borrow or to read. 
Eric Law wrote a very interesting book published in 1993, right after Los Angeles Rodney King Grace riot in 1992, immediately after, and he was impacted by that. It was a similar riot to the one taking place in Minneapolis today. In his book, which entitled The Wolf Shall Dwell with the Lamb, a spirituality for leadership in a multicultural community. Law raises the question, was the miracle of the Pentecost a miracle of tongues or was it a miracle of ear? If I ask you that, what would you think? Was the miracle of the Pentecost, was it a miracle of tongue or miracle of ears? I'm sure many of us, I used to think that way, that it was a miracle of tongues. Well, it was both. It was a miracle of tongue, but also was a miracle of ear. His conclusion is it was both. He believed that God has given the power to speak to the powerless and marginalized, as God promised all along, and as we saw in the references I mentioned above. But equally, God also gave the miracle of listening Listening is a wonderful thing. Listening is a gift. Majority of our trouble and problems are from speaking. The people who are going to be condemned the most is people who speak and preach, right? Because I have to be very careful. But the gift of listening was given to the power, powerful people as well. So people are speaking with tongue, they were empowered, it's, it's a power. But equally, the power to listen was given to the rest of the group. Law recognized the difficulty of the existence of different, different cultures in one place. But it happened in the Pentecost, and it happened in the beginning of the creation, and God was intentional about it. So, Eric Law, I start to talk about another image. Hang in there with me. This is the last point. Another interesting image. He caught Isaiah chapter 11 from 6 to 9. Anyone knows what that means? What it says? Isaiah chapter 11, 6 to 9. It says, The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy opposite of what we're seeing. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Law suggested that all parties, for, for all of these animals to live together, of course this is a prophecy about the peaceable realm of God a peaceable kingdom where there is complete peace. Nobody's going to hurt anybody else. But the source of that is the power of the Holy Spirit. When the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon, that's why my brother and sister, and we did sing, and I appreciate very much Emily putting all of these hymns and, and all of the reading, the, the, the prayer of confession, they're all fitting together wonderfully to remind us about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And what are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Number one, love. Love, peace, joy. Well, how we get that? That's the image here in Isaiah chapter 11, giving us a picture of animals. Well, think of me, for this to happen, perhaps, you know, for the lion to live with the lamb, well, the lion got to give something, right? The lamb got to give something too. The lamb got to give his fear of the lion. The lion need to learn to be vegetarian. <laughs> right?
right. Everybody got to give something, somehow, so that we can live together, so that we can create that wonderful realm of God, that proph prophecy of getting all nations and tongues, people from every corner of the earth to get together. Here is the good news and the conclusion of, of my word. And you're going to like this. I like this. You have done this. You have done this. When you called me, and I know you probably are not thinking about it, but as someone who is different from you, someone who is considered from the margin, in fact, I was so back home too. It's not because I am, you know, Egyptian American, I'm a minority here. Back home, I was religious minority. I was a part of the Christian community, which is, uh, in fact, I was a part of the Presbyterian Church, which is a minority of minority of minority, okay? You have Presbyterian, but then you have the Christian, the whole Christian body, which Coptic Orthodox, right? And you have all of this, but then above all of that, then you have the Muslims. We have 100 million people in Egypt. Only 12% are Christians. That's all Christians. But only about 1% or 2% are Presbyterians. So you can imagine, okay? So by calling me, my brother and sister, somebody from the margin, and yet a preacher. You call me as a preacher. You call me as your leader, in fact. That's amazing. You have given me the voice to speak while you are listening. Do you hear me? Do you get the signal? Do you understand? I hope that you and I will go out and tell this story. This is a story to be told to our nation, that people can work together and can accomplish things together and can not just meet the standard but exceed the standard together. This is a message that our nation needs today to hear. A message of peace, reconciliation, and love. Don't just take this in its literal sense that I am speaking and you're listening, but in its marvelous spiritual mean, meaning. You and I, I have this story now to tell to the nation in the midst of conflict and division in our country. And we are not the only one, we're not. There's so many, many, many congregations like yourself and many people like myself who walk together and love each other and preach that message of peace and reconciliation. May our story together be that story that inspires our communities and our nation and even the other, the world. Every nation has its own prejudices. I have my own prejudices or, or I had so many of those when I was back little man or little guy. But I learn now, I transform every day. We transform. And as Peter, the, the, one of the greatest saints, was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. May God transform all of us and transform this nation to pursue just and peace priorities. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now let us affirm our faith by standing and affirm what we believe by repeating the Apostle Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. 
Gracious God and wonderful Father of all, thank you for your Holy Spirit that open our eyes today. This is really powerful that we are your people, all of us, and that we come from east and west, north and south, and sits at one table, at the table which made by our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. We pray, Lord, today that you may continue your wonderful healing touch to people who are urgently needed. We pray particularly for Paul Gregg, I pray, Lord, that you may reach out to him. I pray, Lord, that you may pour your, your wonderful healing spirit upon him, that he may recover, strengthen him in his body, but also in his spirit, and be with his friends and his family and loved ones as they surround him with their loving passion and pray for him and help us to continue remembering this wonderful young boy or young man, Lord, in your mercy. We are so thankful for Alex and for his healing and, and, and for him to be with us today. And thank you for the family in their mourning. Yet the word that I heard, it was celebration of life. And that's exactly what needed to be with every time we lose somebody. We may be lose this person here on earth, but we are celebrating the joining of him or her in the wonderful reign of peace, of no tears, and of love there in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. We are also thankful for the graduation of so many in our community. And I pray, Lord, that you may bless the teachers, bless the headmasters, bless the schools that they study, or, or right now, when it is very difficult for them to get into school, yet the teachers and the school staff doing amazing job to continue their message of teaching of love and of sacrificial giving to their students. I pray for all of them and for our nation and the nations of the world to heal and to uh, uh, be delivered from this uh, virus we came to call coronavirus. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, finally, we pray and we continue to pray at this moment for Minneapolis, Minnesota, for Los Angeles, for so many big of, uh, uh, many of our big cities. Pour your Holy Spirit on leadership, on people from all walk of life. Help them to control their anger. Help them to control their violence. Help all people to behave according to the power of your Holy Spirit. Let them utilize their power, their authority for good, for compassion, for love, not for the execution of power and might. Because you promise that it is not by power or might, but by your spirit. We pray all of this in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and let everyone say, Amen. And let us all together in one voice pray the prayer that God taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. I believe we have a minute for mission. This being Pentecost, we take up a Pentecost offering, and our
Pentecost offering uh, goes for uh, many things. 40% stays with the local congregation to develop and support programs for young people in our own church and community. And knowing that we've went through this period when our children have not been in school, uh, you know, it's important. And young people are what is the future. 25% supports young adult volunteers. Those, pe those young adults who have went out and done service uh, and are able to go to different communities and grow in leadership. 25% goes to support ministries with the youth throughout the whole Presbyterian church. And 10% is devoted to children at risk to improve education and provide safe havens. The Pentecost offering is one of four annual special offerings our church. The church-wide special offerings of the Presbyterian Church play an important role in defining what it means to be a connectional church in the 21st century. And knowing that the many problems around the world, we need to be connected. Bringing together the diversity of the Presbyterian Church USA to focus and take faith-based action on shared concerns. Please give generously. There's offering envelopes at, at the back if you didn't get one. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Lord of wind and fire, of hope and mercy, we ask that you bless these gifts today. We praise you for them and ask that you, you cause them to be put to work for your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us close our worship by singing in Christ there is no east or west. يباركنا الرب ويحرسنا يضيء الرب بوجهه علينا ويرحمنا يرفع الرب وجهه علينا ويمنحنا سلاما ونعمة ربنا ومخلصنا يسوع المسيح محبة الله الآب وشركة الروح القدس تكون معنا وتدوم فينا من الآن وإلى الأبد And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and ever more